Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my Friday message. My special guest this week is Sarah Armstrong, a professor of pediatrics and population health sciences and director of the Duke Children's Healthy Lifestyle Program. Dr. Armstrong is the chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics section on obesity. We'll be discussing the AAP's new guidelines on the assessment and treatment of childhood obesity, which is a strong predictor of health challenges later in life. Sarah and her colleague Chris Newgard and DMPI are also featured in this week's School of Medicine's online magazine, Magnify. The article covers an innovative new childhood research project that uses both basic research and community-based clinical research to examine the paradoxical link between food insecurity and obesity. Before we talk with Sarah, I'd like to share a few updates. In response to declines in COVID case numbers and severity, university leadership is lifting or easing most COVID protocols on campus. Surveillance testing and formal student COVID case management have been concluded, and the SimMon app for reporting symptoms will be retired on April 3rd. However, masking is still required in all patient care and clinical settings, such as inpatient units and hallways patient rooms, clinical waiting rooms, and examination rooms. Masking is optional in non-patient care areas in all buildings, such as work rooms, break rooms, conference rooms, shared offices, and administrative areas within the health system. And of course, we all need to respect the need and wishes of our colleagues who still opt to wear a mask. Last Friday was match day, one of the most exciting days in the life of every medical student. 106 fourth-year students opened their envelopes and learned where they'll be doing their residencies and continuing their training. I am so proud of every one of our graduating students, and I know they will excel in the next stage of their learning and beyond. The Dean's Distinguished Research Series continues next Thursday, March 30th, with a trainee poster session and faculty talks by Dr. Araglu and West. They are open to the entire School of Medicine community, and I encourage you to attend and hear firsthand about some of the most exceptional research that our faculty are doing. Lastly, I am happy to announce the first ever Dean's Staff Awards. These will be annual awards to recognize exemplary staff who support the School of Medicine's mission and values. Staff are the heart and soul of the school, and I am delighted about this new opportunity to celebrate their contributions. Please watch for additional details soon. And now, please let's join me in a conversation with Sarah Armstrong. So Sarah, thanks for talking with me today. I understand you recently updated the new clinical practice guidelines for children and adolescents with obesity. That's right. And it had been since 2007, the last time they yeah. were updated? Yeah, so, um, so for clarity, the 2007 recommendations were still expert opinion and literature review. So this um, 2023 clinical practice guidelines, actually the first clinical practice guideline that the American Academy of Pediatrics has published on child and adolescent obesity. So 15 years of evidence intervening, and the difference really is, is that it was guided by a systematic evidence review um, and grading of the evidence, which didn't happen in the prior guidelines. So we feel really confident in the level of the evidence um, that were included in this practice guideline. So Sarah, what are the major takeaways from the new guidelines? Yeah, well, I think the key message is that there's no evidence for watchful waiting. I think taking a immediate approach to recognizing the obesity and offering evidence-based treatments is really important and not waiting to see if the child will grow out of it next year. I think the second most important takeaway is that we really wanna take a whole child approach um, and not just make decisions based on a BMI, but make decisions based on the family context, the social and environmental context, and what else the child has going on in their life. And then I think the third point, which is really good news, is that we now have safe and effective treatment options for children that we didn't have before, which includes intensive lifestyle treatment, you know, done in collaboration between clinics, academic centers, and community partners, we have new medications that are very effective for children, and bariatric surgery, when that's indicated, can be really effective for children and safe to help um, prevent the consequences of obesity. Any highlights from the treatment aspect? Well, some of the really safe and effective treatments are new um, since the last uh, guidance, and um, we really see this as good news, that children have options we didn't have before. So for children six and up, we have intensive health behavior and lifestyle treatment, which really wraps around the child and family, is intensive, um, and involves physical activity and nutrition, 
delivered in partnership with community members and, and with clinics and academic medical centers. Um, now for older children, 12 and up, um, we have even more advanced options that should be delivered in partnership with that intensive lifestyle treatment. That may include uh, medications that, um, that can help reduce appetite and help improve the response to treatment and lifestyle treatment. Um, and then also for children 13 and older, um, weight loss surgery. So either the vertical sleeve gastrectomy or Roux and Y can really um, be a safe and effective treatment option for children with more severe degrees of obesity or for those who have already developed some of the medical complications of obesity as children. So not only are you a clinician and advocate for guidelines, uh, you're also a researcher. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your research, particularly your new endeavor with Chris Newgard. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, there's a very interesting association between obesity and food insecurity. And when we think of all the social drivers that are likely to influence obesity, food insecurity is pretty, you know, rises to the top because it's about the food you eat and how you're nourished. So, um, you know, interestingly, I think maybe ironically, people might think that if you don't have enough food, you should have a lower body weight, but it turns out that the opposite is true um, pretty consistently across ages. So, you know, it's unclear exactly why that is, and um, Chris and I are going to try and unravel that association a little bit with some shared clinical trial work and basic science work. And then we're going to see if we fix the food insecurity, do we also fix the obesity? You know, and if not, what are those unmeasured factors that we need to be paying attention to? And if so, how do we get those data into the hands of the policymakers so we can prevent this early in life? Because we know that obesity by age three is likely irreversible, which is quite young. Um, so we need to really be able to, to fix it quite, quite early. So thank you so much, Sarah, for your work, for joining me today. And I really look forward to following up on the NARS study. Thank you. And thanks to everybody else for all that you do. Have a great weekend.